Thank you, everybody, and good evening. It is an enormous pleasure and privilege to be with you here tonight in New York. Thank you, first of all, Dr. Nurse, for that very warm introduction. And of course, I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Greengard and Ursula for, and the Rockefeller University and the Selection Committee uh, for honoring me with this very special award. As I've learned about the award, I really think the story behind it is truly remarkable, very inspiring. And when I look at the women who've received it before me, I feel very humble to be in their company. I also feel very greatly privileged to have had the opportunity to meet Dr. El Sadar and hear about her amazing work. I will take that story back with me and um, I will continue to be inspired by it. So tonight I was asked to tell you a little bit about my scientific story. Well, Paul has told you some of this story, but I'll tell you about it from the inside instead of from the outside, perhaps. <laughs> so when I was a child growing up in Melbourne, if you told me I was going to become a scientist, I really would have laughed in your face. <laughs> I, from the earliest time that I can remember, I lived in a world of books, and I was quite convinced I was going to be, become a world-famous novelist. In fact, when I was 12, I actually wrote a book, tried to get it published, and of course, I failed. <laughs> I also realised I was much too conventional to have a life as a, as a writer, but who seemed to me to have to have these very dramatic and um, uncomfortable lives, and I was much too conventional for that. So my seduction by science was actually not a sudden revelation. Rather, it sort of crept up on me. Like most scientists I know, and I'm sure there are many of you in this room who can tell the same story, my interest was first sparked by one remarkable teacher. Mine was Miss Laura White in Year 9 Biology. She had such a passion and a sense of wonder for the natural world that I couldn't help but be impressed and infected by this. But the die was not really cast for me as a scientist until my first year at Melbourne University. I was doing classical genetics and Paul, I have to confess, I was really struggling. <laughs> and then came the lecture that truly transformed my life. Professor Michael White, another White, not related, uh, rushed into the lecture theatre. He was literally shaking with excitement and he was brandishing this journal, this scientific journal. Why was he so excited? He told us that it had just been discovered that each chromosome is comprised of a single giant molecule of DNA. And the concept of this continuous ribbon of hundreds of thousands of genes obviously blew him away. And I believe that he literally imprinted on me this day an enthusiasm and an awe about our genes and their organisation and their function that has never left me. I went on after that to major in biochemistry and I was really lucky because it was just when the genetic code was being cracked and everything was just so exciting. I caught the research bug and decided to do my PhD, but um, not in Melbourne. I had wanted to travel ever since I was a tiny child and so I decided to go abroad and um, do my PhD overseas. So, very naive, very audacious, I wrote to Francis Crick, and I was even more audacious than you know. I had the cheek to go to the library and look up to see if he was still being productive. <laughs> when I think about myself at that time, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> so, um, of course, I wanted to go and work with him because um, where he was, the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, was the mecca of molecular biology at that time. And this was where Watson and Crick had discovered the structure of DNA. I still don't know why he took me on as a student in his department. I think perhaps it was simply because he'd never had a letter from so far away. <laughs> but being accepted as a student was actually only the first hurdle to clear. I also had to get a scholarship. There were very few scholarships in those days. There still aren't enough, but there were very few then. And when I tracked them down, I was really horrified because all but one of them specified they were for men only. Can you believe that? But it was really true. There was only one exception, 
It was a UK award set up to celebrate the Great Exhibition of 1851, and I was fortunate to win that scholarship. So I started um, in Cambridge in late 1966 after taking six wonderful months to travel in Europe. In fact, by the time I was to go to Cambridge, I didn't want to go at all, I'll confess to you. I felt like going to prison. I, here I was, traveling Europe. Can you imagine anything better when you're 21 years old? <laughs> or I was a bit more, I think. Anyway, Cambridge at the beginning was not much fun. It was really quite tough because uh, being neither male nor an undergraduate, I felt very marginalized. Cambridge was very different in those days. I also felt very inadequate in the scientific hothouse of the Laboratory of Molecular Biology there, or LMB as we called it. The postdocs and scientists there worked with a dedication to science that I had never seen before. Their entire lives were absorbed by it. Many seemed hardly to sleep, and everyone had incredibly high standards and expectations of themselves and others. They were in a race with the rest of the world to unlock the secrets of life, and they intended to get there first. But against that um, huge competition, what a, an incredible set of role models I had. Francis Crick, flamboyant, urbane, always locked in intense intellectual conversation with the brilliant but very sardonic Sidney Brenner, very scary he was. And he just started his epic um, genetic studies of C. elegans. Fred Sanger, very different personality, very quiet, a wonderful man, the pioneer of protein sequencing, who just published his RNA sequencing methodology, which was to become so important for me, and was now setting out to sequence DNA and win later his second Nobel Prize. And Max Perutz, the gentle and unassuming director, deeply buried in his own private world of X-ray crystallography, and yet still able to find the time at a Christmas party to introduce me to Jerry Adams, a postdoc who'd just arrived from Harvard from Jim Watson's lab. Well, life in Cambridge became fun after that evening. <laughs> Perutz couldn't have foretold that Jerry was destined to become my scientific and life partner. And actually this year we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary and every one of those years has been simply wonderful. But returning to those early days in Cambridge, my PhD project under Brian Clark was to purify and sequence a transfer RNA, one of the adapter molecules that decode the language of DNA into the language of proteins. The task seems trivial by today's standards, but the sequence of the first such molecule had only just been published, and that had taken a marathon effort of several years by a large team of very experienced biochemists. And here was me, this very naive <laughs> PhD student working by myself. As you can imagine, I had some rocky times, but eventually I did succeed, thanks to Sanger's powerful new technology. At the end of our period in Cambridge, Jerry and I married in Melbourne, and then we went to the University of Geneva as postdoctoral fellows, and we had a wonderful time there. Really exciting science, interspersed with great amounts of memorable food, wine, and travel. <laughs> I can thoroughly recommend going um, somewhere very exciting for your postdoc. But then we had to face reality. Um, this was a big decision point in our lives. Where would we set up our own lab? The obvious path, Jerry being American, was to go to the US. And indeed, we were invited by Jim Watson to go to Cold Spring Harbor. And our lives would have been very different had we taken that course. But Jerry, um, who's a very special person, knew my heart was still in Australia. And in 1971, we made the decision, which was very risky at the time, actually, to go for at least a few years to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, where Gus Nossel had recently become director. We'd visited the institute, I, I organised this actually, during our honeymoon, <laughs> and uh, had been very impressed. Um, like the LMB, this was clearly a place where people were passionate about science and which played on the world stage, and we didn't want by that stage to settle for less. 